real quick, do you remember what the average score for this quiz was? Not two point three. Wow. All right. What would be a good test for this problem? Which test? Root or ratio? I'm going to say probably root. Root. So this is all to the nth power. So if you hit it with the root test, it will basically eliminate that power. So this one's perfect for the root test. So you're taking the limit of the nth root of 1 over 1 plus n to the nth power. And this nth root will cancel out the nth power completely. And this is the easiest limit. We've probably done all quarter. What's this limit? Zero. 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 So there we go. That's our row from the root test, which is obviously less than one, so it converges. So usually the root problems will be pretty obvious. So it'll be stuff to an n power, and then you can just take the nth root. So we'll do the last problem in this section. Would you not be able to do like just a p-series on that? Or does the p-series have to be just one? Oh yeah, so th there's always, you can always, not always, but generally more than one test will okay. tell you convergence or divergence. Okay. What you should never get is one test tells you this converges, another one tells you it diverges. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so you applied at least one of those two incorrectly if you okay. apply two different tests and get two different results. Um, there are times where the ratio test will be inconclusive, and then maybe the limit comparison test will tell you converge. So it's okay to have one test give you inconclusive results. So our next problem, we got 4 to the n times n factorial squared divided by 2n factorial. So this, <coughs> this problem is not good for the root test because there's only one term to the nth power. So we're going to go for ratio. Now when we do ratio, we have to be very careful. There's a lot of n's here. There's three different places n appears. So we got quite a bit of algebra to do. So before I even apply a limit, let's look at the an plus 1 over an term and then reduce that down. So I very carefully replaced n by n plus 1. So what did I say was the first thing that we should do when we're trying to reduce these down? So we're going to change around the fraction so we put similar things above similar things. So obviously base fours, those should go together. That should be really obvious. So I'm not really trying to do any simplification. I'm just rearranging right now. I'll simplify on the next step. So I have my, my square factorials. I'll go with next. And again, I'm not trying to reduce them at all right now. And now my two ends. So in this case, we basically have three terms, or three fractions we're trying to uh, match up. So any questions on this rearrangement here? All right, easy question. What does that first factor reduce to? That's just a four. We got one more four at the top, so that's the easy one. I like to do the easy parts first. So let's move into the middle term now. What can, yep. That equals four because you used the, uh, the thing that you used to pick the numbers from the, the pair all the last. 
So, well, I have one more four on the numerator. So they each have four to the n power, and there's an extra four in the numerator, that plus one. Um, I think we did, did this before where I wrote four times four to the n, that's four to the n plus one. So that four n cancels the other four to the n. All right, middle term, what can I do to this term here? So I can't, I can't really mess around on the, uh, on the inside here because I have that square power going on. Like I can't break into that without dealing with that power. What can I do with that power? So it's both of these squared, so I'll just raise the entire fraction of the square power. So I call this factoring out the power. So I can write it as n plus 1 factorial over n factorial, whole thing squared. You can factor out powers? Yep. So that is this rule. It also works for uh, products. So multiplication and division are very good friends with exponents. Addition, subtraction, no, not good friends at all. You got a lot of work to do if you're going to try to turn <laughs> yeah. those around. All right, uh, last up, all I'm going to do is just distribute the 2 into that last term right there. So we got 2n factorial divided by 2n plus 2 <coughs> factorial. All right, now that I made things a little bit less bad, do your best to reduce these two, the last two terms here. So you're going to reduce them by writing the factorials as, I'll help you on the first one, we got n plus 1 times n factorial over n factorial. That's that middle one right there. The next one's a little more tricky, so do your best and break out that 2n plus 2 factorial. You need to factor a few terms out of that. You got some questions, a good time to ask them. How did you pull out that out of it? So the n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n times n minus 1, et cetera. So I just brought out the first factor out of that factorial. You're going to have to bring, I think, the first two out of the second mm -hmm. factorial. Yeah, so it's the uh, So you want the bigger factorial or the denominator? So that guy in the denominator is 2 and plus 2 factorial? Once you finish that, go ahead and take your limit, because that's what we're, we're doing.
Carlson. Yeah. And it sounds, I, oh, never mind. Those are two different numbers. I thought for a second those things, I thought the N plus one, and I thought it was the N plus one in the bottom there, and thought different numbers. Yeah, so I can actually, there's a little algebra we can do here. So, any questions on the algebra steps that I took? So that's really the... Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> right there, see? Okay, I was just making sure. It's like, I don't know what that step was. Just evaporated. So I'm going to cancel one of the n plus ones. And that 4 divided by 2 is just 2. All right. What is this limit here? It's infinity over infinity. So I can go L'Hopital's or physicist's method. So L'Hopital's derivative of 2 times that stuff is 2. The other derivative is 2. And limit of that, 2 over 2, which is 1. So any questions on getting that limit of 1? I use L'Hopital's rule here. I took derivatives. Yeah, basically if I was doing physics method, this is what my paper would have looked like. I guess, I guess you can still leave the n and the n, but it pretty much it's kind of the same thing. All right, why is one really, really bad? It's the worst thing to get. Inconclusive. inconclusive. That means all the work we just did? Wasted. Pretty much wasted. This is why we use symbol <laughs> <laughs> Like your spring break, wasted. All right. That's Kidding. That's all right, what else can we do? Now, if your ratio test gets inconclusive, your root test, your root test is very likely going to be inconclusive as well. Plus, if I did a root test, I'd have to look and see how do I do a root of a factorial. I think I maybe wrote that in your notes a couple pages back. But Would there be a, a more, like, would you use a different test in that case if, like, a question like this was on the midterm, or would you just say it's inconclusive? So I'll give you partial credit for telling me that the ratio test is inconclusive, <laughs> but that doesn't go to answering, does it converge or diverge? So you successfully applied a test and you told me the correct conclusion, which is I don't know anything. Um, <laughs> right? If it's true or, you know, converge or diverge, and you do a test and the test says, We don't know. Then, I don't, that then you don't know. Waste of time. You spend 15 minutes. Well, it's was it a waste to do that algebra? Well, I mean, yeah. So that algebra is very useful. And it was just unfortunate that we didn't get a, uh, that if that 4 to the n was like a 5 to the n, we would have had success right here. Quick, quick, or a failure, I guess. Part, uh, the What's that? What was the just doing algebra Practice. on factorials. Oh, Practice. Practice. Okay. All right, so let's try nth term test for divergence. So maybe if these things don't get small, uh, then they, uh, we can say that it doesn't converge. Well, let's try the nth term test. Integral test not going to work. We can't integrate factorials. So integral test pretty much will never work on factorials. So we're going to try nth term test. Oh, somewhere I need to write inconclusive. So for the integral test, the and uh, make sure you draw an angry face too. Was that partial credit as well? If it's really good. <laughs> the angry face. How'd you do that so well? What drawing class did you take? <laughs> I that class. <laughs> That's my figure drawing class. <laughs> <laughs> it's A plus work. He looks genuinely angry. Yeah. It's not the first angry face I've drawn. <laughs> yeah, it's not the first time my ratio test has come up inconclusive. <laughs> After doing a half page algebra. It's not N plus H or N plus N. Nth. All right, all we're doing is take the limit of a n as n approaches infinity. This is another example. Right. This is, um, 
Yeah, so we're, we're applying other tests. Uh, the only other one I could think of is the uh, comparison. comparison test. That's about it. I don't really have many other ones out there because of these factorials. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is think about, so first of all, which factorial is going to be the biggest of the three factorials? Which factorial is going to be the biggest? The 2n factorial. Definitely be the biggest. So I'm going to decompose that a little bit. So it's 2n, 2n minus 1. 2n minus 2. Now I don't know what n is, so I'm just going to write dot, dot, dot. Why did I stop at n factorial? Why was that a good move? So you can cancel out one of the n factorials? Yep. So I can cancel out one of the other n factorials. All right. So this will make it less bad right there. So any questions on that cancellation right there? Would you include all of those other um, ends on the denominator? Oh, definitely, yeah. So how did you go from negative 2 to positive 1? Oh, that's the dots. Okay. So it just keeps decreasing by 1? So once it goes to like how many it takes away 1 from the end? You just keep, this is the product of, let's say n is 100, for example. So 2n would be 200. It would be 200 times 199 times 198 times 197 times et cetera down to 101. What I'm saying is shouldn't that be 2n plus 1? What? No. So there's n, there's n terms right here. Yeah, it should be n plus 1. Okay. The, if, if I wrote the 1 before, it would be n plus 2, n plus 3. <clears throat> I agree, the pattern doesn't... Um, the pattern looks kind of strange because I went from 2n down to n, but there's a lot, you know, if n is big, there's a lot of products for the, the dot, dot, dot. 10 terms. We don't know. It depends on how big n is. Yeah, if n is 10, there'll be 10 terms total right here. It'll be from 20 down to 11. If, oh, okay. if n's 100, it'll be from 200 down to 101. Yeah, no, I was lost a little bit too. No, I got it. Now you're found. <laughs> oh man, now I'm not sure how we're going to proceed after this. <laughs> Is that so, the first time ever? Lopital's rule is not going to work well here. There's obviously infinity over infinity. Because so we got huge products over other huge products. Um, there's n terms right here. There's also n right here. There's got to be something clever, a clever estimation we can use here. It seems like the numerator is bigger. Yeah, because it's got it to an n power. Mm. All right, when in doubt, just write out the terms in the factorial. So, 
Okay, so <clears throat> what could I, one thing I could do, I have four to the N or N fours up there. So I could multiply one of them, one four into each term up here. So I can distribute four, 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 four. Each one of them can get a four. There's N terms, I got N fours. So I can multiply all of them by four. So we could write it as 4n. Now this next one is going to be a little annoying. It's 4n minus 4. Four n minus eight minus twelve times four. So there's a bad phenomenon going on. The la when n is big, the last term, if I tried to pair them up, the numerator would be smaller than the denominator. However, the first term, the exact opposite is happening. On the last term, my denominator, this would be small, uh, big. But my first term, that would be big. So I can't just make a nice estimation here. So somewhere along this chain, they switch places. All right, let's forget about this one. Maybe I'll go solve it and post the solution up on later on. <clears throat> There's probably a better estimation to make, a better way to pair things up. This is probably a silly question, but what, um, when you multiply 4 to the n um, by n, what, what happens to the exponent? Why is it just 4 n? So there's n terms right here. There's n terms. Okay. So there's you could think of four to the n as four times four times four times four n times. Oh. So I'm not distributing across addition. I'm not actually distributing. Because distributing is what we, we when we multiply across addition, we call that distributing. So what did you do? I just multiplied terms together. So it's uh, okay, I see. So it's as if four is in each row because it's 4 to the n. So you kind of replace the n for the 4? So 4 minus 3 equals 1, is that where you go to 1? No, four, uh, 1 times 4 is 4. That's why there's a 4 there. I multiplied all the terms by 4. And I was allowed to do it because there's the exact same number of 4s as there were terms. That makes sense. Thank you for explaining So I didn't, I didn't multiply across addition. I multiplied across multiplication. So that's why I needed n of these. I couldn't just use one of them. So if you would have had 3 to the n, you couldn't do that? No. I can multiply everything by 3 then, yeah. If I had n minus 1, I, would run, I, I wouldn't be able to multiply. One of the terms wouldn't get oh, a. So you just n need is 1 is 1. Then. And we don't know what n is? Well, in the limit, n is infinite. But right here, it's finite before I apply it. I haven't applied the limit yet. I can't get this into a form that's nice enough to say what the limit is right now. There's probably an estimate, and then you can use a sandwich theorem, but I don't know off the top of my head what that one is. Because. Does that work for you? That's beautiful. So there's three fours and three variables. So each one can get a four. So that's just a fancy way of multiplying because you have an n power? It's, well, yeah, this is four cubed. This is the commutative property of multiplication of real numbers. I can switch the order around. So I'm just changing the order. Can I ask you a question? Is sequences and series really easy and we're just thinking this is the hardest thing ever? Uh, not the infinite ones are not easy, no. Yeah, I don't think it's easy. Let me, let me ask Most you people one, don't think they're one easy. Last question. So basically, you're having an intermediate step because in my head, I'm thinking of putting, eventually, you can, 
simplify all those by multiplying them together, you get four times four, four x times four y is like sixteen x y. Yeah. So right, you basically are multiplying them, and you just have it in the terminator state. You don't take it down to the most prime form. I'm just pairing them up differently. That's all. Well, they're still it is. Yeah. It better be equal, or else I'm. Pairing them wrong. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. They all should be. Yeah, I'm just regrouping basically. Like pretty much it's all we're doing is regrouping and simplifying. That's that's pretty much what the algebra you're going to be doing in this chapter is. And then are choosing the best test to use. All right, let's jump into alternating series. Alternating series is probably the easiest section in this entire chapter. All right, alternating series either goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, or starts with a minus and alternates. So alternating series just means goes positive, negative, positive, negative. Uh, generally, you're going to see a negative 1 to the n, or you could see it written with some trig, depending on, there's different trig functions you can use, but these are generally how you're going to see it. So we're ready for the alternating series test. Alternating series test. All right. First of all, your series has to alternate signs. Yeah, because cos zero is one, cos pi is negative one, cos two pi is positive one. You can do it with the tangent or sine, or, but, but you have to be very careful about what you're, you have to offset it by like pi over 2 or something like that. So you need your series to alternate. The terms have to get small, which means <coughs> absolute value of ak plus 1 is less than absolute value of ak. <coughs> And they not only have to get small, they have to get very small, meaning the limit as k approaches infinity of a k needs to equal zero. This is what you need for the alternating series test. Pretty much you're only going to use the alternating series test if your series alternates. So if it doesn't alternate, you can't use this test. The limit of the terms have to be zero. So they have to get not just small, but they have to go towards zero. If they get closer to like a half, no, it won't converge. Okay. So these are all in the conversion or diverging here? Yeah, so if you fail the alternating series test, it does not necessarily mean it diverges. Uh, for example, every, po every series that does not Alternate, which is basically every series we pretty much looked at, is going to fail number one. But it definitely means uh, if it fails this, it definitely means that it doesn't converge, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it diverges. Yeah, so if you fail, if you fail this, right, so the root and ratio test told you if your row is small, you converge. If it's big, you diverge. So pretty much if this fails, you get kind of like what we It's inconclusive, yeah. So root and ratio test and integral test are kind of special. And actually, comparison test is too, because it will tell you convergence or divergence. This one is less special. The nth term test is less special as well, because they only tell you one of the two is happening. So why do they use uh, like this uh, different methods instead of using the ones that always work? There is no method that always works. We just saw the ratio test fail. It was inconclusive. There is no test that always works. Are there, are there Probably, yeah. yeah. Some series. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So, um, I was more into algebra and geometry rather than real analysis. That would be a real analysis question. I'm not a real analysis either. 
Uh, it definitely makes your head hurt, I'll say that. <laughs> Thinking about infinity is definitely a, uh, difficult, to yeah. say the least. <laughs> so prove this converges. So this is called the uh, alternating harmonic series. All right, so I want you to prove it right now. Number one should be really obvious. Alternates because negative one to the n makes it alternate. All right, so prove number two and prove number three. So the inequality should be pretty easy to show. The absolute value just gets through that negative one to the n or to the n plus one. So <clears throat> there's the inequality line right there. Any questions on that line? You can generally do them in one line. I started, what I started with was the far ends of it and then I kind of worked to the middle. So I start at the far ends and I work my way to the middle. Now, this limit for number three was a little tricky because I had negative one to the infinity. We know that's either one or negative one. So intuitively, the denominator keeps getting bigger and bigger and the numerator stays relatively close to zero. So intuitively, it should be zero. The right way to show it is the sandwich theorem. You pick two other terms that are one's a little smaller, one's a little bigger. They both converge to zero when n gets big and then the one in the middle has to converge in between them. So it converges to the only number between zero and zero, which is zero. So I just use the sandwich theorem right there. And now I'm gonna say by the alternating series test, we just showed one, two, and three, the series converges.
Yep. Just uh, regarding the second line. So if the formula reduced down to 1 over n plus 1, just is it because negative 1 to the n power switches between negative 1 and 1? Yeah, the absolute value is what basically eliminates those two right there. Got it. Okay. If it was negative 2 to the n plus 1, I had to be more careful. Right. It would be the absolute value of, so if I had something like that, um, this would not equal just 1 or 2, but this would be positive 2 to the n. So if it wasn't a base 1 or negative 1, it would come out yeah. to something like that. Generally, it eliminates the negative sign, but you have to be a little bit careful in some situations. Like uh, one example is maybe n squared minus n is not necessarily uh, n squared plus n. You have to be a little bit careful. Products are much nicer with absolute values than addition. All right, and that's the only example problem that I have for all training series. So we're going to talk about different types of convergence. There is absolute convergence. <clears throat> so it means if the summation So if the summation of the absolute value of the terms converges, then we say that this summation an converges absolutely. So if an converges and that absolute value of an diverges, then we say that summation an converges conditionally. So conditional convergence means you need that sign to change in order for it to converge. So every test, uh, all the series that we looked at, pretty much in the other sections converged uh, absolutely. They were already positive. So the only ones that are converged conditionally are the ones that you needed the alternating series test to get convergence. And we get uh, the triangle inequality. Which is x plus y absolute value is less than or equal to absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. <clears throat> this just comes from the fact that if x and y are both positive, it's obviously equal. Uh, if they're both negative, it's also equal. But if one's positive and one's negative, then if you absolute value them separately, you'd get a bigger number when you added them together. Uh, and the triangle inequality leads us to this inequality. So if you add up the absolute value of the terms, you, you could get a bigger number than if you added up the terms and then took an absolute value at the end. Now if all your terms are positive for all k values, then uh, then absolute value of ak equals ak, so of course that summation absolute value ak equals summation regular ak and if they're already positive it equals the absolute value of the sum so if everything's positive absolute value doesn't do anything 
So pretty much almost all the series we looked at before were positive. So they fell under this category. We didn't need to worry about them being negative at all. And a lot of the other tests require your terms to be positive anyways. In fact, the ratio test requires them to not even be positive, but they can't even equal zero.